Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar. We're going to give people just a minute or so to, to trickle in, and then we'll jump right in. Great. Well, let's let's jump in. Um, welcome everyone to this webinar on stacked incentives. Um, I'm Sarah Derringer. I'm gonna gonna lead the webinar, and I'm joined by my colleagues Jessica Wilson from City of Austin Watershed Protection Department and Megan Sherry from Environmental Incentives. And I'll I'll introduce them more in a moment. Um, but yeah, just excited to have you all here. Um, we recently released a report on stacked incentives around co-funding water customer incentive programs. We're excited to share some of those findings as well as really dig into some examples from, um, from Jessica and from Megan. So with that, let me jump right in. Um, so um, we're, we're from the Pacific Institute. Um, we're the ones hosting this webinar. Um, and the Pacific Institute is a nonprofit water research institute based in um, the California Bay Area. Um, but we have folks all over the US and all over the world um, working on creating and advancing solutions to the world's most pressing water challenges. And we have three major focuses that we work on. Um, one around working with um, frontline communities or vulnerable communities. Um, another around focusing on nature-based solutions for water and water efficiency and reuse. And as part of that work, um, we also work on advancing sustainable water management through multiple benefits. And the report we're presenting today is part of this larger body of work looking at how to incorporate multiple benefits really meaningfully into our water decisions. And so that goes from everything from identifying those co-benefits of your water projects to quantifying benefits and really communicating them with stakeholders and with the community. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more about that, I've included a link on the bottom right of this slide, um, pacinst.org backslash multiple benefits. And then today we're going to really dig into our most recent report on stacked incentives and how co-benefits can really help to build these collaborative partnerships and actually co-fund water customer incentive programs. So with that, today's agenda, um, I'm going to talk about our report um, and define what are stacked incentives and share some of the program models and keys to success that we learned through interviews with water managers. Um, and then I'm going to pass it over to Jessica to talk about the Rain Catcher pilot program in Austin, and then to Megan about supporting water quality and water supply objectives in San Diego through stacked incentives. Um, I encourage you throughout the presentations, if you'd like to um, ask a question, there's a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to put in questions there. And I think you have an opportunity to upvote questions too, if someone asks something you're also interested in. Um, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so with that, I will, I will jump right in. So first, um, I just want to share acknowledgments to those of um, you, some of you who are on the webinar today who um, shared your time and your knowledge with us throughout this project. Um, we went through a process of interviewing um, water managers and those who work with water agencies throughout the country, um, and we've included them here. And this project was supported by the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation. So what are stacked incentives? Um, stacked incentives are customer incentive programs that are co-funded by two or more separate entities. And these programs often provide co-benefits to the different agencies that are involved, as well as the customers. 
And we see the different program models really mirror the types of programs that customer incentive programs traditionally look like. So you could stack rebate and discount programs. Um, you could ta uh, stack technical assistance programs or educational programs. And we'll talk about some examples for each of these. But essentially, you could have a rebate and discount program that has two agencies that contribute to the same pot of funds or to the same um, program and pass that to the customer. You could also have technical assistance programs that, for example, would um, help work with a, a particular resident or homeowner um, to look at both water savings potential as well as energy savings. And then there's a lot of opportunity in these educational programs as well to think about what are the water benefits um, that you can engage with customers on, as well as, let's say, biodiversity benefits or other um, educational opportunities. And the reality is that these programs are happening throughout the country, um, that there are stacked incentives happening um, in many places. I have here a, a map of the US, and these are the ones that we identified, but there certainly are many more. Um, and I encourage you, if you have a stacked incentive program, to share that with us as well, if, um, if you're not on this map yet. Um, but they are happening everywhere, but not as much as they could be. And the goal of this report really was to figure out how do we make this something that can happen um, through everywhere and for everyone that wants to be able to co-fund their programs. And today, Jessica and Megan are gonna share two examples um, from San Diego and Austin to help walk us through really what are the, the keys to how they've made these programs successful. Um, in the report, we, we also looked at kind of what are the kind of keys to success and um, and we don't think that these are the only keys to success, nor do we think you have to do every single one of these things, but these were through our interviews what came out as um, some of the, the high level um, things that helped folks get these programs in place. Um, the first was around envisioning the program to include co benefits. Um, to really think about if you have a customer incentive program, what are the other benefits that come from that? Or who are potential partners that you could work with? Um, we also um, heard that there was a lot of work that needs to go into actually building those partnerships. So building relationships with other agencies that may want to co-fund programs. Um, and then there was some value in quantifying some of the benefits that you're looking at in order to engage some of those, um, some other agencies. Um, and for some agencies that did require qu real quantification of how much, you know, how much energy savings is coming from this program or how much water supply opportunity is coming. But then for other um, agencies, it may not need a, a strict quantification. It may need to look more like um, uh, what, what types of benefits do we expect to have? Um, are there some biodiversity benefits rather than quantifying you know, the number of species changed or supported? Um, we also heard a lot about the need to focus on logistics and particularly around funding logistics. And so we provide in the report some examples of opportunities to look at how to fund these programs and really work through the kind of the nitty gritty of it. Um, and then finally around marketing and outreach that um, there's a lot of both opportunities but potential challenges in making sure that you're marketing these programs. One of the other things that really was ubiquitous among all of these different programs was the role of third party coordinators um, and engaging um, a, another group that can help you to um, work all the way from envisioning the program through the logistics and the marketing and outreach. And we found that third party coordinators kind of fit into each of these different places and they look different in a lot of the different programs. So for example, some programs will have a third party coordinator that's a nonprofit group that already works with a particular segment of the community. Or um, in some cases, like Megan will talk about, it's a consulting firm that can help with quantifying benefits and, and building those partnerships. And then finally, we also saw this need to uh, adapt and improve the programs over time. So kind of start over at the beginning. And once you're marketing and outreach, maybe it's not reaching all the customers you hoped it would, but there's this opportunity to think about co-benefits again and really bring in more partners and make this an iterative process. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of um, keys to success and highlight um, just briefly some of the examples that we found. Um, first, on envisioning the program, we found that it seemed useful for a lot of water managers to consider starting with existing incentive programs. So thinking about a program, let's say a turf replacement program for native landscaping, and then thinking about the benefits that that program already provides. So um, perhaps you're a water conservation agency or utility and you're thinking about, well, it reduces potable water demand, but what else does it do? 
Um, it can help with increasing local, local habitat availability or decreasing stormwater or dry wet and dry weather runoff. And that gives you an opportunity to think about other potentially interested parties that would want to um, work with you or stack this incentive um, for, for the program that you already have. Um, and then we also looked in detail at kind of the funding and contracts logistics and seeking out ways to reduce administrative burdens. And this is both because there may be additional challenges of stacking the incentives, but also there's an opportunity to reduce your own administrative burdens by looking into these programs. And so for example, um, a water utility in um, San Antonio worked with the Trinity Glen Rose Groundwater Conservation District. So um, from San Antonio Water System, working with Trinity Glen Rose to be able to say, well, we have this irrigation report that we're already working on. Can we, can we use the same report? Can we help a customer to only need to do one report for a water audit as well as a nursery giveaway or another incentive? And that's a way of reducing some of that administrative burden both on the agencies themselves, but also on customers. Um, and these seemed particularly common as well around um, water and energy um, uh, combination or joint programs. So um, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and Southern California Gas, so SoCal Gas, um, that this was um, one of the earlier um, opportunities for doing these sort of master inner utility agreements. And so in 2013, they put together kind of a, yeah, and essentially a, an MOU among the, the agencies saying, when we do water and, effic and energy efficiency programs, um, how are we going to engage with customers? How are we going to measure the benefits and report those benefits? And really setting up that process early can help reduce um, any of the challenges that may come up later. And then finally on marketing and outreach, we saw that there was a lot of opportunity for water utilities and for others to consider the message that they're able to share with co-benefits, but also the messenger. So if there's more agencies or utilities or nonprofits involved, there's an opportunity to think about who's the best messenger for this and what is really going to engage customers. So for example, New Mexico Gas Company um, really has been focusing on the water savings that um, their, their programs can provide um, because folks in New Mexico seem particularly receptive to that messaging. Um, and so it gives you this opportunity to think about, um, yeah, again, like what is the message that you're trying to share and what will resonate with your customers as well as who um, should be the one or could be the one that shares that message. And then we also see a lot of opportunity for stacked incentives to help contribute to water equity. Um, by stacking incentives, you have this opportunity to increase both the total incentive that you're providing to customers or reach more customers with a particular program. Um, it's also an opportunity to reduce the burden of engaging with incentive programs for customers. So for example, if you had a, a technical assistance program um, that needs to go into someone's home and maybe do a water audit, that you have an opportunity to do a water and energy um, audit at the same time and really reduce the amount of time that that customer needs to be engaged in the, these audit programs in order to receive the benefit. Um, and it also provides an opportunity to engage with historically hard to reach customers. And that can include particularly re reaching renters um, by stacking different programs together um, to, to be able to engage and actually get incentives to all of your customers. But we found that this doesn't happen without a lot of intentionality, um, that making sure that water equity is, is part of the program really meant starting at, that, at the beginning of when you're visioning the program out, thinking about how do we reach all the customers we need and want to reach at that time. So overall, there were some key findings. Um, so again, water managers are implementing stacked incentives throughout the country, um, but there's really an opportunity to do this more, um, to think about how do we co-fund our programs? How do we make sure that we're, we're really getting to the folks and the customers that we wanna get to? Um, and we found that stacked incentives really can help increase the total funding for multi-benefit projects and programs. Um, it's a way of saying, you know, we're doing these things in silos, but how do we make this truly an integrated or multi-benefit program. Um, Third-party coordinators were really key to success for a lot of the programs that we uh, and, and water managers that we talked to. Um, and they can look really different for different programs. It may be a nonprofit, it may be um, a consulting firm or another utility or agency that acts as the coordinator. 
but that they were really helpful for dealing with both the, the visioning, the quantification, and the logistics of the program. Stacked incentive programs may help deliver more equitable programs, but again, that takes a lot of intentionality. Um, and we see a lot of potential here, but also um, needing to really make sure that that's a goal um, and putting that toward the beginning of the program that we're putting together. Um, and then finally, we found that stacked incentives have this opportunity to provide local water and climate resilience. Um, if we start thinking about integrating our programs more, um, there's this great opportunity to think about how um, incentives can reach both water and climate resilience simultaneously, thinking about the carbon benefits and the water benefits, thinking about how do we um, respond to natural disasters and, and what would that look like if we were able to incentivize, incentivize these programs on private properties. So with that, I'm delighted to hand it off to um, uh, my colleagues, Jessica and Megan. Um, Jessica is um, has led the City of Austin Watershed Protection Department's education and outreach team for almost a decade, um, which engages with community members um, to understand the local environment and become stewards of it. Um, the team regularly collaborates with organizations throughout Austin and has a great um, set of programs, including youth education programs for elementary students, um, all the way through young adults. They have a Grow Green program, uh, my personal favorite, the Scoop the Poop program, Storm Drain Marketing, and the Innovative Rain Catcher Pilot Program that she's going to talk about today. Um, and as the ways that people receive information has diversified, Jessica's team has grown to ensure that the department's message is shared through uh, many different forums, including websites, social media, videos, inter interpretive signage, and campaigns and newsletters. Um, and Jessica, as I mentioned, is going to share more about the innovative pilot program in Austin focused on distributed rainwater capture and stacking benefits. Um, and then after Jessica, Megan Sherry is going to um, share some work that um, she's been working with the uh, in San Diego on. And Megan is a senior associate at Environmental Incentives with experience working with municipal water supply and stormwater teams to develop performance driven programs that achieve water supply and water quality outcomes. Megan is currently leading development of a rebate and incentive program in San Diego to improve water quality and stacked incentives for multiple benefits. Prior to joining um, environmental, incentive, uh, environmental Incentives in 2019, Megan was the Director of Development and Partnerships at the Alliance for Water Efficiency, where she worked with national networks of water providers, businesses, and other stakeholders to identify and implement policies to advance water efficiency and community resilience. So um, with that, I'm delighted to pass it over to Jessica. Thank you for having me to join the conversation today. So it's wonderful to spend time with all of you. And I'm going to be presenting on behalf of the Rain Catcher Pilot Program team, but I wanted to mention it's a very large multidisciplinary group who's been working on this effort for years. So just to give you a high level overview of the program, really what we're doing is we're trying to get water to slow down and soak into the ground. And our department, Watershed Protection, we're focused on flood, erosion, and water quality, but pretty quickly realized that there were many more benefits to these types of systems. So the pilot program that we're working on is in a relatively small geographic area. It's at the top of one of the watersheds in Austin, at the top of Waller Creek Watershed. And we launched the pilot program in October of 2018, and it has five phases. It's going to run through January of 2024. And throughout the process, we are gathering data, constantly working to refine and improve the program. Right now, we have just begun phase three of this project. And by the end of it, it'll have been offered to about 1,300 homes. So Sarah asked me, how did you come up with this program? And it goes way back and like many of the conversations you've likely been having, it builds off of conversations from the past. When I joined our department in 2011, the department had just formed a green infrastructure team. And so I was asked to serve on it. I had several subgroups. And so I led the education and outreach portion of it, but then worked very closely with the other groups as we were working through technology analysis and benchmarking and the regulations that might pose barriers to the adoption of green infrastructure. Because back in 2011, 
we were still much more heavily focused on some traditional stormwater measures that you might think of like sand filters. And so this team wasn't just looking at small scale decentralized green infrastructure, but green infrastructure at all scales and how we might want to move forward with that. In 2012, the city adopted what we call Imagine Austin, which is our comprehensive plan. And Imagine Austin identified within it that one of its key areas was green infrastructure. So we were in a good position to participate in and inform that conversation. In 2016, some of my colleagues completed a report which was called Urban Hydrology Restoration, a proof of concept modeling. And it took the area where we are now running this pilot program and ran it through a series of models to see what would happen with various levels of adoption of decentralized controls like rain gardens and cisterns on private property. In 2017, we completed some local surveys that a grad student helped us with, as well as we did national benchmarking to really get a feel for what was happening with incentive programs throughout the nation and what was or wasn't working, what were the lessons that they were learning along the way. At that point, we had decided we really were ready to move forward with trying to do a decentralized approach and focusing on private property. And so we continued to enhance a lot of the relationships that we had, as well as really fine tune what some of these funding relationships would look like before we launched. And then in 2018 is when we, we launched the program. So as we were doing the national benchmarking, some of the things that really became clear was we had several barriers that we wanted to overcome. The first was people were intimidated by these concepts. We throw around GSI, but that is in and of itself intimidating. And so to address that, we came up with the concept of having City of Austin rain catcher ambassadors who promote the program. You have to know that it exists before you participate in something, but also go and meet with people who are interested in it and walk the property, really help them to feel confident in what might happen and what the possibilities are. The next barrier that we wanted to overcome was we realized that it was very complicated to work with the city and to work with multiple city departments. So we wanted to find a way to streamline the process. So we have hired a local nonprofit called Urban Patchwork. So they help connect community members with contractors, and they also help manage the various stacked financial incentives that we're providing because we really want to center the community members and everything that we're doing and make this as positive and seamless as a process for them as possible. And then funding, something that came up in our local studies is funding really was a barrier to people's participation. In Texas, our storms are bigger. Everything's bigger and better in Texas, including our storms. And so the systems that we put in place need to be big. We uh, weren't doing one rain barrel on a house. We're looking at cisterns. And so that means more money. And we don't want that to be a barrier for people. So this is where we worked with other departments um, and gave an additional dollar per gallon ourselves to really try and stack these benefits to make it where it's something that's achievable for people. And this graphic showcases some of the multiple benefits of having a rain catcher landscape at your property. So while our department, again, is most focused on holding that water on the land and slowing it down, there are also a variety of benefits that really help the entire community and are of interest to our other city departments as well as other organizations. One of the first partners who we reached out to was naturally our colleagues at Austin Water. Austin Water, have, they have the local expertise in providing rebate programs. They've been doing rain barrel giveaways and then moved up to bigger incentives um, since the 90s. And so we did not want to recreate the wheel or compete against another organization that was doing it. That only adds to the confusion of community members. So we worked with our friends at Austin Water to see if we could stack incentives. So they continue to bring that expertise to the table, participate in our regular meetings. They administer the rebate programs as they were doing before. And uh, I featured 
three on this slide, but they have many more. These are just the three that are most closely tied to the Raincatcher pilot program. And they are heavily focused on conservation of water. So early on, we had lots of conversations about this cistern because in a Texas location where we deal with drought, wanting to conserve and then hold on to water and keep that cistern full is a very real thing that many of us feel. And Austin water, you know, needs that water to be available to be used in the landscape. From an urban hydrology standpoint, we need that water to drain out. So we then have storage capacity for the next storm. And so we had lots of conversations around that point because essentially we all want the water to go to the landscape. If we conserve it too much, then we still aren't using it on the landscape. So that's not meeting Austin Water's goal. If that cistern is full and it's just old water that's been sitting there, it's not reaching our goal of being able to hold more with the next storm. So what we've done is we've set many of these up as passive irrigation systems. So they passively drain the water from the tank, it gets it into the landscape, but it allows us to have that storage capacity for the next storm. Our department, we really were focused on bringing people together. So we administer this pilot program. We have very friendly and talented ambassadors who serve as that community liaison. We fund the nonprofit partner that we have brought in to support this. We, we chipped in an extra dollar per gallon and we also have a, a drainage charge discount. So if people are installing these on their properties, they, we have a monthly fee and they can reduce their fee on that. And something that's very exciting because we are a data driven department and always focused on learning more, but we have several scientific and sociological studies that are really focusing in on this area so we can gather a lot of data and analyze what's going on there and how we can always continue to improve. Urban Patchwork is our nonprofit partner in this. And so, like I mentioned, they really are focusing on streamlining the process. They help with site assessments, connecting with contractors, they the inspection of systems, which that is an efficiency now that we've established trust and expectations there where you don't have multiple city departments going out to inspect something. Um, and they fill out the rebate applications, submit reports to us, and they're also doing contractor training as this is still an emerging field. And what we're doing is something that's a little bit innovative with the way that we want to see it happen. One of the key reasons that they were selected as the nonprofit partner to work with and we have a master agreement with them is because they were one of the few nonprofits that focused on private property. There, we have several that focused on public space, but it's a very different relationship when you are working on somebody's private property. There's different legal agreements and ways that you work through that. So they brought that um, to the table. And then urban forestry. So everybody, loves trees and we do a lot of analysis in Austin to look at areas where we want to increase canopy cover. So the area where we're running this pilot program is one of those spaces where the staff who work on urban forestry were interested in getting more trees there. A challenge that anybody who's planting trees faces, particularly where we have such a boom and bust cycle with water in Texas, is getting those trees watered until they're established. And so in addition to providing funding for the tree, what this group does is they also um, pitch in $1,000 towards the cistern. So the water gathers in the cistern, it goes through a pipe underground, and the water comes up and bubbles at the base of this tree. And so this is one of our rainwater irrigated trees that is just thriving, and we're so excited to see that happen. So this is where not that many people typically want to dive into, but I think a lot of the participants in today's um, conversation will be interested in. This is the behind the scenes of how complicated it can be to move some of the funding around when you're working with so many partners trying to stack it in. And this is very much a simplified version of what happens. But in order to, to move the funds, uh, the urban forestry funds come to our department. We provide reporting data to them. We give that money to Urban Patchwork. Austin Water is also providing the funding to Urban Patchwork. 
And then that is going to the contractor. The property owner, they pay the balance. Um, so they have a co-payment that they pay. And really the key here is that the property owner is only needing to deal with that one payment process. Um, they're, you know, they're aware of what the other costs are that are happening, but they're not dealing with the logistics of it. And as we look to the future, I'm so excited that we are working with Asakura Robinson and the University of Texas on a behavioral and market study because we have a firm understanding of what's happening now in this upper portion of Waller Creek, but we're really interested in ensuring that the lessons that we've learned here and what the community is telling us help set us up for success as we look to serve the entire city. So we do have a very robust study going on that's going to take two years. It kicked off this year and will wrap up in 2023, which is before we wrap up our pilot program. So we're able to take lessons learned from this behavioral study and use it in the pilot program that we're running before we look at going citywide. Uh, and pieces that I'm super excited about are we're setting up everything um, that in the study with an equity framework in mind, really centering listening to people and their needs, trying to understand different barriers that people might be facing. And then we have some experts in agent-based modeling and structural equation modeling who will be working with all of that data to really analyze it and make some recommendations to us. So some additional benefits and incentives that I'm excited to explore further as this continues to grow is one is green job creation. These are things that we're already exploring, but we're at the beginning of. And so one example is we're working with the Park Ranger Cadet Program, which is a high school program. And this year we're funding a peer mentor as well as high school interns to focus on environmental education and green stormwater infrastructure. And for the first time this year, we're also going to be hiring an apprentice who is a recent high school grad. So I'm just so excited to see how we can weave what we're doing in with green job growth. We've also talked about and we're working a lot on how these systems can support the community through extreme nature and weather events. So I think the default that we often think of is drought. But in Austin, we've also faced uh, drinking water issues as we've had a major flood, which then that overwhelmed the water treatment system with sediment. We also have zebra mussels in our river system, our reservoirs. And recently, we had winter storm Uri, which knocked out power, but it also disrupted our water supply in Austin. So we had people gathering snow to then try and melt that to, to flush the toilets. Another aspect that I'm really interested in is health. So we talk a lot about the environmental health, but how does this impact human health as well? So with the environment, we know that it can help with cooler temperatures, improve air quality. We focus a lot on, on the creek health, um, but it can also, uh, we think, have some mental and physical health benefits too. So we know that things like gardening are stress reducers. So people who have these systems, that could be something that is reducing stress in their life. For neighborhoods that have more of it, it creates more of a nature connection, which is again, is a stress reducer. And then recently we surveyed community members who have cisterns that are 500 gallons and more to learn how their cistern during the winter storm. What type of cisterns did they have? Did they break? What broke on them? Did they use the water? How did they use it? Were they using it to flush toilets? Were they boiling it to drink? And also, how did it make them feel to have the cistern? And people responded that they felt reassured knowing that they had an alternate water source. So, in addition to managing these stacked benefits that we traditionally think about as a city utility, we're also helping the community understand and appreciate the infrastructure that we're stewards of. We're connecting people with the earth and we're bringing people and organizations together to really get to know each other and look towards a positive future. So I believe that these stacked benefits, which we don't talk about as much in reports, 
but they really help to create a healthier community and world for all of us. If people would like more information about these programs, we actually have two websites that I think you would like digging into. So raincatcheraustin.org is our landing page for program participants. It's really, it's their gateway into learning more about the program. And then the city's webpage, austintexas.gov slash raincatcherpilot, it is a great location if you want to dive more into some of these reports and studies that we're doing that are building our program and our knowledge about decentralized green stormwater infrastructure. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Megan to continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Jessica. Just to confirm, uh, I think I am sharing my screen. Does everybody see this coming through? Yep, looks good. good. Perfect, thanks, Sarah. All right. Um, well, thanks, Jessica, for, for sharing the Austin program with us. I'm, I'm really um, excited to, to learn quite a bit from your program, which is a, a few steps ahead of, of the one that we're helping develop here in San Diego. Um, so to get started here, I'm Megan Sherry. I work with a firm called Environmental Incentives, which partners with municipal water managers to maximize the effectiveness and impact of their programs using performance-driven practices and tools. And I'm here today to talk about uh, a new stacked incentives program um, that we've been helping develop in San Diego and to share some insights that I hope will help attendees here and the um, partners that you work with to explore similar opportunities in your own communities. Uh, so I'll just start by defining the water quality and quantity nexus, um, kind of hone in on what that looks like in San Diego, uh, and introduce the stacked incentive model that is developing here, and then spend a little bit of time on uh, sharing some insights from, from our experience in a quite unique role um, here in San Diego that uh, I hope will be, will be valuable to you all. So first I'd like to introduce the organizations that are coming together in this stacked incentive partnership and their their agency goals. The County of San Diego uh, and their Watershed Protection Program um, is responsible for stormwater management and water quality in the county. And they're working to preserve you know, safe, clean waterways and healthy stream ecosystems by preventing pollutants from entering the storm drain system and receiving waters. They're also working towards a number of compliance targets, um, including a, um, a near-term requirement to reduce dry weather runoff. Um, much of that is irrigation runoff. Uh, and a longer term uh, requirement to reduce wet weather bacteria in, in rainy events. We're also working with the San Diego County Water Authority, which delivers uh, water to nearly 3 million people, more than 3 million people here in San Diego through their member agencies. And, um, you know, a primary focus for them is, is advancing efficient water use as a, an important part of their supply picture in an arid and water constrained region. Uh, they are also facing um, some regulatory um, drivers uh, for, for this focus, including some new efficiency standards that are coming down from the state in the coming year. So this partnership was, was first envisioned as the Watershed Protection Program began work to develop incentive programs um, that would help private properties manage water on site, uh, which is a strategy in their water quality improvement plans. Um, and as part of, of that work, um, they looked closely at existing programs in the region. And San Diego County Water Authority, like, like many water agencies, uh, offers a variety of landscape incentive programs that really do double duty. Uh, so con smart controllers, replacing turf grass with native landscaping, and agricultural efficiency, um, all programs that exist here um, and have, have been well established since the 90s, um, reduce water use, but they also drastically reduce irrigation runoff, which contributes to, to dry weather flow into our storm drain systems. Um, likewise, rain barrels and cisterns um, help support the county's wet weather goals by disconnecting impervious roof area and providing source control um, to help reduce pollutants like phosphorus, bacteria, and nitrogen. So, um, you know, we 
the county, you know, immediately saw the multi-benefit nature of these programs. Um, and then, so, you know, we saw that the, the infrastructure was here to support a potential partnership. Uh, so on the right, you can see the county's jurisdiction in blue overlaid with the water authorities service area. Uh, and we learned that 90% of the county's um, constituents, par their parcels are eligible for these programs. And furthermore, um, penetration across these programs or the number of properties who have already participated is relatively low, which created significant opportunities for uh, additional benefits. So seeing this opportunity, um, the Watershed Protection Program and the Water Authority have worked together over the last year um, to come together and stack incentives for the five programs you see here. Um, turf replacement, weather-based irrigation controllers, rain barrels, cisterns, and an agricultural irrigation efficiency program. And these offerings are going to be available to, um, to county customers starting sometime next month. And there are really three organizations involved here. The regional incentive program um, through South SoCal Water Smart is administered by the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. And they provide the base incentive as well as a lot of the infrastructure that processes applications, um, checks eligibility and delivers rebates directly to the customer. Uh, County Water Authority will add in additional incentives um, when funding is available and support coordination and delivery to customers on the ground. Uh, and now the Watershed Protection Program is coming in to increase the incentives to pay for those water quality benefits that I mentioned. And when you look at the stacked incentive total, you can really see the potential impact of these kinds of programs. Uh, for turf replacement, we are bringing the total incentive for customers to $4 per square foot. And when you consider that the average costs of turf replacement projects are, you know, is between $3 and $5 per square foot, um, we are starting to provide near full cost coverage for projects, uh, which really you know, makes this much more attractive to people considering these changes. <clears throat> Likewise, uh, for cisterns, this increased cost coverage um, brings you know, the total cost coverage for a customer from 50% closer to 75% for the most commonly selected cistern. So we really see this as an opportunity to um, drive people towards those larger storage solutions. In addition, um, we're also working with the Watershed Protection Program to pilot some new programs like rain garden incentives that can integrate really nicely with these offerings. Um, so I, I'd like to just share, you know, our experience uh, as, as kind of a third party coordinator um, working with, a, with agencies on this type of program and, and share some insights that I hope may be, may be useful to all of you based on what we've learned in San Diego um, and similar efforts that are taking off in Orange County. Um, so the first being that water quality permittees and water providers have really distinct objectives, but they are aligned in such a way that there is immense value from um, pursuing these kinds of partnerships. Secondly, Sarah talked about quantifying benefits. We really found that this was an essential part of the process that paved the way for, for this kind of partnership and, and sets it up for success. Um, and thirdly, as you know, having played that third party coordinator uh, role ourselves, um, we've got some thoughts on, on how, you know, having, how having a partner in this, whether it's a nonprofit or another, another agency, um, can really uh, improve outcomes for both agencies and customers. Uh, so first, you know, wh why, why are permittees and providers such a great match? Um, so for water providers, you know, the, the value proposition is relatively straightforward, um, you know, filling funding gaps. Uh, water authority fund incentive programs here in San Diego are almost entirely grant funded, and most programs nationally are funded out of operating budgets or grants. So they're often a victim of revenue shortfalls or you know, when, when grant funds dry out. Um, so this you know, co-funding provides an opportunity for um, bridging those funding gaps or providing more stable funding. Uh, in this case, bringing needed uh, resources into the program to improve performance um, is of great value to the Water Authority and its member agencies. Uh, we are using this co-funding to um, add technical assistance for harder to reach customers and strengthening marketing to reach customers in, in different ways and with messages that might uh, resonate with them better. On the water quality side, uh, in Southern California, stormwater permittees are, are needing to produce real water quality 
uh, results required by their permits. And while capital projects can take years to build um, and there's limited county land available for them, uh, by tapping into these existing programs and working with uh, private properties, um, permittees can potentially you know, achieve hundreds or thousands of projects in just a few years. Um, these incentive programs also give uh, water quality permittees a new tool to work with to assist communities in a way that provides real value, like helping them achieve cost savings or um, upgrade their properties. Uh, and so, you know, when as a water quality organization, um, when a lot of your, your responsibility is passing along requirements or, or issuing citations, it's appealing to have another tool in your toolbox. Uh, and then finally, it's worth mentioning um, that the Watershed Protection Program really saw the value of the cost savings um, associated with being able to leverage uh, the existing infrastructure, um, all of, you know, everything that goes into checking applications, delivering, uh, delivering uh, payments, et cetera, um, and the, the market awareness of these existing programs um, rather than reinventing the wheel. So that was definitely a, a key piece of the value for them. We also saw that having a consistent quantification method uh, for benefits and tools uh, to estimate the benefits of these programs was important at every step of the way. Uh, for a water quality organization that is um, you know, often thinking about a handful of large projects, it's, it was really critical to show how individual projects done on private properties um, can add up to something meaningful for water quality. And we did this by defining a clear metric, acre feet of dry weather flow reduction, methods to estimate reductions from different types of projects, um, and developing a parcel scale benefit calculator to measure those individual project benefits. Um, and in the early stages of this partnership, the Watershed Protection Program used these methods and tools to do a backwards look um, at what benefits had already been achieved. And, and we learned that, you know, across just three programs over the last 10 years, um, you know, they had already reduced dry weather flow by nearly 400 acre feet. Um, and those reductions were, you know, already contributing to water quality. Uh, so this was a really important step because it allowed decision makers to see the potential impact of being an investing partner in these programs um, and allowed us to estimate the future benefits. Um, you know, if we added a certain dollar amount to the incentive, what kind of, uh, you know, increased participation could we expect and therefore what scale of benefits. Um, and then finally, you know, Sarah talked about how a third party partner uh, was a nearly ubiquitous element of the programs that they saw. And uh, you just heard from Jessica um, about the breadth of services that, uh, you know, their nonprofit partner can can offer um, and, and what they bring to the program. Um, you know, we've done some thinking about, you know, why why that might be and, and um, ways that private uh, partners can can help you in development of a stacked incentive program. Uh, so first, you know, sometimes having that outside perspective and that issue expertise can help a team better perceive the clearest opportunities that produce the best benefits for all parties. Uh, so in our case, um, my team had deep water quality expertise as well as water efficiency experience um, to be able to facilitate information flow and propose the specific enhancements that met the needs of both agencies, whether it was you know, adding just that additional dollar that could really tip us into the realm of full cost coverage or you know, focusing on commercial customers for smart controllers um, because that's, there were some major barriers there. Uh, secondly, um, you know, we found that working with a third party can help an agency take advantage of private sector nimbleness and speed, um, sometimes, you know, a, an innovation mindset. Um, with support from uh, the county, um, we've been able to use a market fo focused design approach where we're rapidly um, prototyping a program enhancement based on um, researched motivators and barriers. We are putting it directly into the market um, and testing it with users and adapting it quickly to learn what works um, before scaling and, and kind of helping us avoid months or years spent on program design that may ultimately not be appealing to customers. And then finally, um, we've also seen the, the value of streamlining and simplifying the customer experience um, through a single point of contact and, and one-stop shop. Um, particularly when the financial incentive isn't enough, which is often the case for some customer segments. And a good example of this is our um, landscape optimization service, um, which is part of the stacked incentives partnership between the two agencies. 
And in this case, the county really saw the opportunity uh, to work with large properties such as homeowners as associations, which typically have large um, turf areas and opportunities for, for high water use and runoff reductions, um, but also you know, low levels of program part participation um, because there are complex decision-making processes and limited resources. Uh, so this is an early, um, an early proof of concept uh, demonstration project we did where we were able to work with an HOA with you know, limited resources to navigate all this and help them uh, transform nearly 40,000 square feet of, of turf grass um, and help them cover more than 90% of project costs um, by using these stacked incentives with some great benefits for both um, the HOA and the agencies involved. Um, and in the process, we were also able to, you know, help build the confidence of the landscaping contractor to then go out and you know pursue these opportunities for other clients um, and thinking about you know workforce development is a major part of the stacked incentives program as we grow it into the future um, so with that just uh, to recap a, a couple of the you know observations that we've made um, developing this this brand new uh, stacked incentives program that we look to share more about uh, in the coming months and years um, they're you know, really is, is potentially a great sweet spot around that water quality and quantity nexus um, that is, you know, likely worth exploring in a lot of communities. Um, secondly, quantifying benefits um, can really set up programs for success and both start a conversation and help track um, and, and adapt performance over time. And then finally, um, you know, look for those those connectors in your communities that can help identify those opportunities you might not know are there and you know, deliver those, those great outcomes for agencies and customers. Um, so thank you for the time today. We are looking forward to sharing more about this as, as this program evolves. And uh, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions in the meantime. Back to you, Sarah. Great. Thanks so much, Megan. And thank you, Jessica. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in and I encourage everyone, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, if we don't get to all of them, we'll be sure to reach out with answers after this. But um, I, I thought I'd start with one of the um, kind of high level questions that came in around thinking about the common barriers or barriers that you all have run into. And then um, I'm going to expand it also to how did you overcome those as part of stacking these different incentives? Um, yeah, I don't know, uh, Jessica, if you want to start. I think really the main barriers that we've seen are finances for people. Uh, another barrier as entities is looking at infrastructure investments that are on private property. So we're very comfortable with doing that on public property. What does it look like to do that on private property? What does that mean for long-term maintenance and inspection? And how do we ensure that we're good stewards of the communities? funding. So that's where we spent a lot of time in conversations. Megan, do you want to add to that one? Sure. I, I think, um, you know, echo exactly what, what Jessica shared there. The finances are, are definitely a major consideration for, for property owners uh, across all customer groups. Um, and then I think, you know, thinking about some of those harder to reach customers, and we focus primarily on large landscapes and, and commercial and, and multifamily organizations where, um, you know, one of the major barriers is just limited, you know, uh, human and, and financial resources as well, but, but really, um, you know, having um, people who can invest the time and trying to figure out what rebates are available to them um, and, and, you know, what does that mean for, for their property and their, their stakeholders. Um, and so that's where we found that, you know, sometimes that financial incentive isn't necessarily enough and it's really those social and informational incentives that can help demonstrate to a group of, of decision makers um, that there's, there's great value in making some of these changes. Um, and, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot of value out of investing in, you know, marketing research to uncover those barriers and motivators and really, um, you know, fine tune programs to more specifically address them. Great, thank you. And actually that, um, that goes perfectly into another question um, around the marketing and behavioral study, which I think came in during Jessica, during your presentation, but I think both of you have participated in these. 
Um, and the question is, are you trying to learn motivations for participation, penetration of marketing, barriers, peer effects, all, some? Absolutely. So in the presentation, I mentioned that we're really trying to overcome three main barriers that we knew existed in the community. So I talked about finances again just now, but the others that we were looking at were that knowledge that the program existed and the intimidation factor with it. And then just streamlining the process because it can be confusing and, and time consuming. And so we're investing heavily in all three of those areas to try and just create this very sophisticated program that from the beginning we felt like would meet the community's needs. But with the market and behavioral study, it's an opportunity to then see which one of those is being the most effective. Is there something else that we are missing? Does that need to be adjusted based on different parts of the community to make sure that we really are being as equitable with our programming as we possibly can be? So we think that we're doing a good job with being proactive and trying to address three of the barriers, but it's a rapidly changing world and Austin is constantly booming. We're facing big issues with displacement and environmental challenges. And so we want to make sure that we are listening and adjusting as we go through. Great, thanks, Jessica. Megan, do you wanna add anything on that one? Um, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, sure, I'll, I'll just, um, you know, echo and, and support the, the argument for, you know, a, a um, sort of consistent focus and, and um, you know, routine investments in, in, in understanding what community needs are. Um, and in our case, you know, using this market focused design approach, we've really tried to embed it into every stage of the process from the research, um, you know, going out and trying to get a sense from um, folks in the county's jurisdiction about um, what you know, what programs were most interesting to them um, through, you know, prototyping projects and and now in a in a next pilot implementation effort, um, we're conducting interviews and doing surveys um, and just collecting a lot of customer feedback. And we've, we've learned um, an enormous amount to date, um, particularly around, um, you know, what those primary motivators are for the large majority of people. Um, and as, as you might imagine, um, there's, there's growing awareness of, of the impact on water quality and, um, and the resources they care about. Um, but the more immediate motivators that really seem to drive action are the opportunities to, um, you know, to save money, to upgrade properties, right, to improve the, um, the space that their spaces that they that they own and live in, um, I think you know that has only increased after um, a period of you know confinement and and needing to you know really appreciate your space. Um, so we've you know we're we're adapting our messaging to really try and focus on those messages that that really seem to resonate with people. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I I feel like there there's another question on here around kind of considering social equity as part of this, and I think that marketing research, it's helpful for generally for customers, but in particular can really help with um, that proactive considering water equity and how do we make sure that these programs really are reaching the people who need and need it most or want it most. Um, yeah. Um, let's see, I think we have time for one more quick one before the top of the hour. And um, it's around um, some of the grant funding that's obtained for this work um, and whether, and, and I think I'd like to expand that a little bit to, you know, what do you see as the opportunities for funding um, as you're considering growing these ty types of programs? Accepting grant funding can be a challenge for the city. And so a part of the agreement that we have with Urban Patchwork, our nonprofit partner, is we actually built it into our master agreement with them that they would pursue grant funding. And I do think that there is a lot of potential when you were just talking about equity and we talk about community and climate resiliency. I know in Austin, something that became very apparent to us was water insecurities in areas where people are maybe in food deserts as well, um, or they're in multifamily complexes. And so how can we center that and ensuring that people have water security during these extreme events. So I think that, that that's a potential that we'll be exploring further as well as green job creation and growth. Great. 
In terms of funding uh, for the San Diego program right, right now, um, so certainly uh, the San Diego County Water Authority and the support that they're bringing to, to this partnership, a lot of that is, is grant funded um, and they're sort of just applying funds for their, you know, secured for their incentive programs to to create this partnership. Um, as we move into the future, uh, you know, we're, we're just starting discussions with, um, you know, both agencies about what future funding sources might look like. And I think, you know, there has been discussion about, um, you know, sort of regional grants and state grants that that can support these multi-benefit collaborative efforts, um, as well as, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, starting to see, you know, I think in some places in California, we do already have, you know, some of these stormwater fees that um, can support these programs as well. Great, great. Well, thank you both so much. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but we'll be sure to reach out. Um, and thank you, Megan and Jessica, for joining us. Thank you for everyone who participated. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to continuing this conversation. Please feel free to reach out to any or all of us. And um, we look forward to talking to you next time. Have a great day. Great. Thanks, everybody.